In September 1971, Lloyds Bank in Baker Street, London, became the scene of one of the most death-defying robberies of all time. This exposed the vulnerability which sent a shudder through the banking world. This particular kind of offence takes major planning. It takes a certain amount of criminal audacity. I mean, explosives, thermic plants, these are serious endeavours. Whilst a fearless gang were going to incredible lengths to reach their loot, they didn't realise they were broadcasting the robbery. I heard somebody say, we've got 400,000 and we'll let you know when we're coming out. It was very unusual, is that the police uh, listening into the broadcasts and trying to track the robbers down. What followed was an extraordinary game of cat and mouse that shook the very foundations of the country's establishment, making this one of Britain's biggest heists. Saturday evening in the affluent area of Wimpole Street, central London. Robert Rowlands, a radio enthusiast, was retiring for the night. I thought I'd go to bed early, read a book, maybe listen to the radio, and so I turned it on and it happened to be on the Citizens Band frequency, which is a walkie-talkie frequency. The trend for CB radio, it's that Citizens Band radio where you can talk to one another, was all the rage in America and it was coming to Great Britain but the government still said it was illegal and so people were doing it illegally and I used to sometimes listen to the broadcasts on my specialised radio and while it was warming up I didn't change the frequency because I was going to listen to Radio Luxembourg. But Radio Luxembourg never kicked into the airwaves. Instead, Roland's tuned into something completely unexpected. And I heard two people talking on walkie-talkies. And I thought, that's very strange. And when I heard them say they'd got about 400,000 and they'd let them know when they were coming out, I knew that it was quite serious. In the dead of night, Robert Rowlands feared he may have stumbled upon a robbery in progress. There were two voices. One was inside the premises and the other voice. It sounded as though it was outside because it was a much clearer signal. So I assumed there was a lookout. <laughs> I thought it might be the tobacconist shop just round the corner. These two were talking together and discussing what they were going to do. And when they said they got 400,000, I naturally assumed it was cigarettes. Concerned that he had somehow managed to tune into a frequency being used by thieves, Rowlands knew he had to inform the authorities. It was quite an exciting moment because one doesn't hear that sort of thing every day. I realised it was a serious situation and uh, I felt, uh, as I knew the person that worked in the tobacconist just around the corner, I thought it, at least it was my duty perhaps to prevent the thing going any further. So I decided to ring the local police station and the duty officer answered the phone and I said to him, I'm listening to the radio and I think there's a robbery going on. He said, oh, that's fair enough, good sir. If you hear any more funny broadcasts, why don't you record them? Okay. As it was a Saturday night and just after 11 o'clock, he presumed that perhaps I was uh, a hoaxer. I was not surprised because I expected him to not believe what I was saying to him because it was so unusual. In fact, I was rather grateful to him because his suggestion was a good one. So we ended the conversation and I got my little cassette recorder out and I recorded the conversations for the next two hours. Although the officer hadn't taken him seriously, on his advice, Rowlands rushed to gather any potential evidence. I got my little cassette recorder and I held it by the radio, got back into bed, and every time they spoke, I pressed the record button. What followed was an extraordinary heated conversation between members of the gang. Uh, that's a bit ridiculous, mate. I'm going to wake up like that. Over. What time do you think you'll wake up? Over. Well, I might just want to come out and come back in tomorrow, might I? going to do that. With one man wanting to take a break, the other clearly had an issue with the decision. I'll suggest you 
just we carry on working at night, mate, and get it done with. It's over. But this was met with a firm response and revealed more about what was unfolding. Then there was the young voice, which sounded like a woman. I was getting quite tired at that point, but when they said that there were fumes where they were, I realized it was a bank robbery and they had to leave because they couldn't breathe. Rowlands realized he was onto something major. With the discussion about security and fumes unfolding, he knew it was vital to gather more evidence. Despite one of the men's urgency to down tools, the other was defiant. Despite a potential robbery in progress, the thieves were getting into an argument about what to do next. There was all sorts of stupid, childish-like excuses, and the, and the people in the bank got quite angry. The lookout man didn't want them to leave the bank, but the man in the bank wanted to leave because they couldn't breathe, the fumes were so bad. In fact, a, a, a deep voice came onto the radio and everybody stood to attention. The man on the roof immediately changed his attitude. It was obviously Mr. Big, the man in charge of the whole operation. And the man on the roof calmed down then. I will stay here. I will stay awake. Will you try and get in a bit earlier? All right? So they left the bank and uh, he was left to sleep or not sleep. The robbers had leaked vital clues and with early conversations alluding to the theft of thousands of pounds, Rowlands was now in a race against time to warn the authorities. It was about one o'clock when I phoned the police the second time. As I hadn't had much response from the local police, I phoned Scotland Yard. I told him that I knew there was a robbery going on and that I'd recorded it. An amateur radio enthusiast has tuned into a frequency being used by a gang of thieves. After hearing shocking conversations suggesting they have stolen thousands of pounds, he alerts the police for a second time in the hope of catching the criminals red-handed. Mr. Rowlands was able to hold the signal uh, with the equipment that he had and listen to the various bursts of conversation, uh, which drew his attention to the fact that this could be not a joke or not uh, somebody skylarking about, but actually a real crime being committed. That was the initial source of what uh, swung into a massive operation. The Metropolitan Police immediately dispatched officers to Wimpole Street. I played some of the cassette and he was quite convinced then that this was a genuine situation. Officers listened intently to Roland's recordings, but nothing else was coming through the radio. They sat there all night until the morning. At eight o'clock, we listened to the radio, it was, still, it was still on, and we were getting quite tired by that time. And uh, at half past eight, it suddenly crackled into life. That's everything, okay. And the lookout was thrilled because he'd been a bit uh, agitated the night before, having to stay up on the roof overlooking the bank. Everything's fine, no intruders whatsoever, however. And so uh, the robbery then continued. Well, these police were absolutely fascinated. After seven hours' silence, the police had a unique dilemma ahead. A major robbery was taking place right before them, but they didn't know where it was. How do you catch a ruthless gang in action when your only clues are voices on a radio? As senior officers quickly scrambled to Rowlands, the gang continued, unbeknownst to them that Scotland Yard were listening in. By the way, they're trailing the road outside somewhere. Over. Okay. 
But straight after this dialogue came a clue that the officers didn't want to hear. They were in there now, over, so pay absolute attention to that front door, over. By now, Rowlands had already heard them talk about thousands of pounds. As the daring gang gained entry once more, officers needed to find the location and fast. Initially, the police took action to try to identify where they could contact radio detection gear to carry out a sweep of the area. Of course, radio transmissions in those days um, were very difficult to locate. Buildings would absorb a signal. The signal itself could be distorted. And so there's no certainty as to which direction uh, the signal was coming from. Shortly after that, there was a bit of a drama because the restaurant next to the bank, one of the waiters must have heard all the noise because he went to the bank and he put his eyes against the window and tried to see what was happening. And then again, he came and had another look. They had to stop work for a short time because the waiter could obviously hear a lot of noise going on. And these clues, I would have thought, would be vital in, in detecting which bank it was. But they seemed to think that there was a lot of drilling of the roads on Sunday mornings anyway, and uh, they thought it wasn't important. But the waiter was important because not many restaurants would be open on a Sunday morning. But as teams were scrambled to search for anything to identify their whereabouts, the one and only link to the unfolding drama fell silent. The bank robbers were alerted by the fact that the waiter had looked through the window and were obviously getting a little bit nervous because they left the bank and they gave an indication to Bob on the roof that they were leaving by saying, Would you like to change to the other channel? Over. And after that, there were no more broadcasts. So one can only assume that, that was the code for leaving the bank. With nothing else to go on, Scotland Yard were on their back foot. Teams of officers were sent to scour the streets. OK, guys, come on, let's move it, let's move it. 750 banks were checked within an eight-mile radius of central London. The actual bank staff, bank managers, bank security people had to be alerted to actually attend with the police and check premises because police don't have right of entry to these places. With no further messages coming through, the officers could not establish if the thieves had changed frequency or had already looted one of the major banks in the capital and fled. They sent squad cars to all the banks, which was complete madness, and I told them about three or four times, this robbery is not in Greater London, it's local, it's within one to two miles at the very, very most. The task now facing Scotland Yard was colossal. An eight-mile radius of Wimpole Street covers 22 boroughs in the capital. With limited resources, Sunday trading hours, and hundreds of premises to check, every officer went to work to desperately try and find the targeted bank. The risk factor for uh, the actual uh, losses uh, were increasing because the simple length of time that the criminal operation had been going on. Really, you're looking for a needle in a haystack. That's the reality of communications at that time. By Sunday evening, more than a day since the first radio communication from the gang was detected, Scotland Yard was still combing the streets of London. And an enormous police operation was going on, but going on fairly covertly in, in order not to disturb the criminals or to try to catch the criminals uh, in the act of uh, committing the crime. In a race against time, more officers were drafted into the already extensive search. As the investigation grew, businesses in London opened as usual on the Monday morning. Well, the bank manager, when he entered the premises, and the vault was open. There were over 260 vault boxes opened, strewn across the floor to any bank manager, it must have been his worst nightmare. Despite the extensive trawl, Scotland Yard had their worst fear finally confirmed. Come on. It was only on Monday morning when the banks opened that uh, the report came in that it was the Lloyds Bank 
at um, Baker Street. Lloyd's in the heart of London had been part of the UK's financial empire for over 100 years, serving customers from its busy branch on the corner of a well-known high street. Their vault housed hundreds of safety deposit boxes containing immeasurable wealth, many of which had been ransacked. The bank manager must have been very, very shocked indeed. He must have really been biting his lip when he reported to his seniors at Lloyd's Bank what had happened. Imagine the effect on the shares market. Imagine the effect on the city that a major bank had been attacked in this manner. On the Monday morning, we waited with anticipation to see which bank had been robbed because it was obviously going to be a feature of uh, the news broadcasts. And sure enough, it was. On Radio 4, it was the leading story. In the headlines this morning, a radio ham in London who picked up a conversation between two men using walkie-talkie sets started a hunt for bank robbers. The police were having to defend themselves uh, because they were being accused of inefficiency and they should have caught the robbers. But they were saying that they'd called in the post office who were in charge of radio at that stage. Now the post office said, well, we don't have experts on uh, 24 hours a day and we called people in uh, specially, but uh, by then it was too late. So you had the, the police to an extent blaming the uh, post office and the post office blaming the police. The simple reason was the minor delays were caused by the difficulties in homing in on a signal on a given frequency, which can be wholly inaccurate. It was quite shocking to think that here in the heart of London, this serious crime had been planned and executed uh, with quite amount of uh, cool criminal endeavor. And at the same time, policing was going on around it. And of course, the reality was that the, the bank involved was just a couple of hundred yards from the Radio Ham's home where he'd been picking up the broadcasts. Despite the mass search, the thieves had been carrying out their attack less than one mile from where Rowlands and the police had been listening in. I knew I was right, but the police weren't prepared to accept that I was right. It was a pity they wasted so much time and effort searching 750 banks in the Greater London area. The most audacious robbery in British history has taken Scotland Yard by surprise. Having listened to a gang of robbers trade remarks on walkie-talkies, Officers searched London to catch them in the act, but the gang got away after ransacking a bank vault only a mile from where police were listening in. Now, further revelations come to light. We'd had robberies where robbers had got in through the ceilings of uh, banks before, but I think this was probably the first that was coming up from under the ground. The hole in the floor was fairly small. I was quite surprised how small it was. It was about 14 inches by 10 inches, something like that, through thick concrete with a little tunnel coming in. The devastation around would have been considerable. Um, the debris everywhere would be quite shocking. The bank staff had started clearing up the mess and they put up some trestle tables. And on each trestle table, they identified various items that were lying about in the vault, which the robbers had left behind, thinking they were of no value. And on one table there was a pile of watches and jewellery, another table piled of uh, sheer certificates and paperwork that had just been thrown on the floor. People who have that kind of uh, security box don't necessarily volunteer to come forward to be interviewed. And as such, uh, the police would have been seeking the assistance of the bank to identify who the people were who actually owned the boxes. This crime was one of a kind. The daring gang had somehow managed to dig their way through mounds of earth and rubble to the floor of the vault. The initial inquiry, of course, which direction was the tunnel going in? Police would not have entered the tunnel immediately. They'd have put their heads down to see which, which direction it was going in. It would have been rather like treating a scene of an accident involving uh, toxic materials on a motorway. You've got to know what you're dealing with. With a degree of difficulty, officers eventually traced the tunnel underneath the bank and premises next door to a shop 25 meters away. Police got into the premises, found brickwork, rubble, earth, sand, all the materials from underneath uh, buildings, and then ascertained just 
how much equipment was there which had to be protected and forensically examined. A huge job, huge. Hello Control, this is Alpha One Charlie. We need forensics as soon as possible. Over. This shop, of course, was the operations room from which the individuals, armed with explosives and everything else, have used as their getaway point, as their arrival point, as their store, as their operations room. They had to drill down through the basement floor in that shop. The actual hole itself was small enough to be concealed using shoeboxes. Very, very claustrophobic conditions. Um, and they went about it with a determination that said to me, there's been a major level of planning involved in this. The scene that faced detectives in the nearby vacant shop was extraordinary. The gang's meticulous planning was evident. The windows were all whitened up. There was a notice in the front to say reopening 1st September. It was a common feature of the West End of London for this kind of shop to close down and reopen with another style of shop. Anybody visiting the shop would have thought that it was a, a purely normal premises. Detectives assessed the scale of the robbery and started the enormous task of finding clues. Meanwhile, rumors about what the gang were looking for in the vault began to circulate. The rumors made it very, very difficult for the operations room to sort out um, what was real and what wasn't real. Allegations that the target was not in fact money and jewels, but compromising photographs of people in power were quickly dismissed by the yard. In order to follow up what was factual and dispel that which was rumors such as blackmail, photographs, stuff like that, think in the line of the way the criminal committed his crime. Blackmail material, I would suggest, if it even existed, would not have been the prime target of these criminals because the simple reason was the kind of individuals that carried out this crime are using explosives and other materials to forcibly enter this bank and then over 260 security boxes within the bank. Their intention would have been to gather as much of value to them as they could. Secondary stuff like material that you could use for blackmail and stuff like that, if it existed, uh, would have been the furthest thing from their minds, I'm sure. The police were quick to quash the rumors, only for another twist to appear. Rob McGuire from the Evening Standard was listening to the cassette, and the police burst into the room, grabbed the telephone from Bob McGuire, he was talking to his editor, and he looked at them, and the policeman turned around and said, we're putting a D-notice on this and you mustn't talk about it. There was a ban or an embargo on the Sunday and the police didn't want to alert the robbers to the fact that they were onto them. D-notices were requests and there were always requests to editors not to use certain material which was seen uh, as involving national security, not something like this. There, there couldn't have been a D-notice because it was fairly widely reported over the following few days. Despite speculation, the press were keen to focus on other aspects of the case. You get uh, ordinary people listening in and then tipping off the media to what the police were up to. You also had robbers who'd get uh, equipment in their cars and, and they would listen to police broadcasts. But this was the other way around. This was uh, the police listening in through the, the radio ham uh, to what the, what the robbers were up to. Okay, forensics. I want each and every father. This rare opportunity may have provided a window into the gang's raid, but detectives were starting from scratch at the crime scene. There was 40 feet of tunnel, ladders, oxyacetylene equipment, explosives, heavy jacking material, a massive amount of material, 800 separate items. Police officers attending there would have taken every step to ensure that that scene was was maintained as a crime scene. And whatever was in the tunnel, if there was anything, the ladders, the debris from the, from the offense, uh, the blown concrete, everything to indicate what type of explosives were involved, what kind of fuse was involved to set the explosives off, what kind of thermic lance material. If they'd wanted to keep their identity secret, they'd have had to keep their gloves on all of the time. But of course, it's not only the individual criminal involved, it's who handled the equipment before that. So the task 
facing the police was one of identification. Forensic examination of the vault, tunnel and shop began in earnest, but it was a different lead that caught their eye. We quickly ascertained that the shop was the operation centre and it was ascertained that the shop had been leased. So from then on, the inquiries based upon the lease of that shop. We had a breakthrough. Yeah? What you got? I've got it. What? The lease. The investigation exposed the individual involved in the lease of the shop. Suspicion was thrown on him immediately. That was a bonus for the investigation. Um, no doubt, had the criminals had time, I think probably that other techniques would have been used to cover the actual leasing of the shop. Police had their first major lead, which led them to 64-year-old leather goods dealer, Benjamin Wolfe. Scotland Yard had a brilliant method of locating and identifying who were known associates. So pools of information were coming through from division, from everywhere. The problem was in bringing this together in a coordinated manner so that it became evidence. Surveillance on him and on co-associates uh, was carried out by other colleagues of mine. Within four days, we successfully identified individuals who became the main suspects for the crime. We linked them together from inquiries, from investigations, from photographic material, in a way that proved that they knew each other. Weeks of painstaking detective work linked Benjamin Wolfe to a number of associates the Yard was very keen to speak to. Reginald Tucker, 37 years old, a company director from Hackney. Thomas Stevens, 33, a car dealer from Islington. And Anthony Gavin, 38, a photographer from Dalston. I think they were an amateur gang that decided on a particular event and probably something triggered it. The man that dug the tunnel, I think, was probably the trigger. Those deposit boxes in Lloyds Bank were subject to extremely wealthy people. Uh, putting their uh, things in those boxes. We eventually were ordered to uh, execute the arrest of, um, of the individuals involved. It took us a little bit of time because the individuals involved were very sensitive to surveillance. They were nervous and jumpy. Ronald Ratcliffe and his team eventually arrested the four key suspects. They were a little bit uh, angry, as you can probably imagine. In terms of violence, no, they didn't offer any violence or anything like that. They came quietly, as the saying is. With the main targets in custody, Scotland Yard needed answers. Despite analysis of 800 items from the crime scene, no forensic clues were left. Clearly, when you think of the size of this crime, um, we were deeply concerned about others, but you need considerable resources, time and evidence uh, to commit to an investigation. And in the end, it may have proved fruitless. The actual interviewing uh, of the individuals involved was carried out by the operations team who had all of the factors at their fingertips, uh, which they could employ in questioning and answering. What bloody walkie-talkie? It's not me, obviously. It was thought that Tony Gavin uh, was the key factor in tunnelling, uh, was the expert, um, was able to achieve um, a, a very, very difficult task in tunnelling from the shop, 40 feet through eight tonnes of material. Um, so I don't think he was alone in that endeavour, but nevertheless, I think he was a key factor. Let's make some money. Thomas Stevens was supposed to have um, provided uh, tools and tooling. But when you think about it and you put together the kind of planning for the operation, I don't think he was alone in that. I think probably when you look at the fact that they would have needed an explosive expert, 
they would have needed a man who was confident in using thermic lancing. The thermic lancing isn't something you can just take on uh, and, and do uh, at the drop of a hat. Uh, it requires um, previous experience. It's believed that Reginald Tucker, using his pseudonym, uh, had previously entered the uh, Lloyds Bank at Baker Street and taken out the box using false details uh, and allegedly had carried out um, the initial measuring of the vault uh, by using his umbrella. My own personal feeling is that due to the accuracy of where the tunnel emerged in the vault, this is a risk that the kind of team planning this operation would not have left to an umbrella. I think that other covert measures of measuring were undertaken, and I think the banking hall was visited probably on at least four or five occasions uh, by individuals who were covert to the operation. But the gang stonewalled officers. Despite this, Ratcliffe had his own theories on their involvement. Yeah. Well. We'll be right there. Cheers. Thanks. The bank itself was wired up with alarms uh, on the windows, the doors, uh, the walls, and, and the ceilings as well, because there had been robberies through people renting premises above and then dropping down into that. But it, it seems as though no one had thought about the, the tunneling. So what had uh, actually happened on the Sunday afternoon was that the, the police had visited uh, the bank with the bank security people. They'd gone inside, checked things, found the alarms were all intact. Hold it, hold it, stop! And in fact, the robbery was still apparently taking place. Lloyd's Bank in central London has been the target of the most elaborate heist the capital has ever seen. The amount stolen from safety deposit boxes potentially ran into millions of pounds. With no sign of the missing loot, Scotland Yard also learned how officers were just meters away from catching the criminals in action. We did visit the Lloyds Bank, but a police officer just doesn't walk into a bank. He relies on authorized personnel to be with him. And so the initial check at the bank and in the area revealed everything to be secure. There was no sign that the vault had been disturbed. Hold it, hold it, stop! My feelings are that probably they were still inside the bank. They were probably ready to make a quick getaway if they had to, but I think that they'd been achieving quite a lot already. Despite this close call, the hardened criminals got away, but not for long. A careless oversight on the lease of the shop led detectives to one of their suspects and the rest unfolded. I think to use the term, uh, I think you could say that they staged storm. We've got your voice on tape. They eventually pleaded guilty on the advice of their uh, lawyers. The jury have reached their verdict. Anthony Gavin, Thomas Stevens, Reginald Tucker. Two years on from the Baker Street heist, a jury found all four men guilty of their part in the crime. Anthony Gavin, Reginald Tucker, and Thomas Stevens each received a 12-year jail term. The judge passed down an eight-year sentence to Benjamin Wolfe, taking his age into consideration. The gang gave little away about the robbery, but thanks to their walkie-talkies and what was left at the scene, we can piece together how they pulled off such a heist. I think there were two, uh, two separate gang areas and as such um, they were disciplined enough uh, to actually interchange because of fatigue the digging of this tunnel itself must have been exhausting um, the actual claustrophobia of going down through the floor of this shop must have been a big strain on the, on the criminals involved and shifted eight tons of material from under the, under the shop, under the premises next door, under the bank. And as such, in doing so, they exposed um, a well which was underneath. They then used extendable scaffolding type ladders, which I think were used like tram lines to shift the heavy equipment 
along. But at one stage, of course, they had, they actually tried with, I believe, with a 100-ton jack to press out the floor. But in doing so, it began to press through, uh, push the, uh, whatever they were resting the 100-ton jack on, through, through the ground itself, rather than achieve the upward thrust. We made it. They knew precisely where they wanted to penetrate the bank. Using thermic lances in enclosed places is extremely dangerous, and they still carried on. They did not give in. They had to resort to explosives to completely uh, make sure that they got into the bank, but in a controlled manner. They used explosives and succeeded in getting in through the flooring without disturbing the doors of the bank. The gang were relentless, cutting through two feet of reinforced concrete from their confined man-made tunnel below. It was chaotic, but the criminals knew what they were doing. Their main target was to remove valuables. Once inside the stronghold, they wasted no time smashing open some of the 268 boxes that lay before them. <coughs> but using heavy-duty industrial equipment eventually proved problematic. How long do you think it's going to be in there? There's too much smoke from this gun plant. I'm making my way back. Mr. Rowlands heard a conversation about somebody being tired and uh, overcome by fumes, and that um, this individual needed refreshment in the way of tea and sandwiches. What followed was a bizarre war of words between those trying to reach the vault and a man tasked with making sure the coast was clear. The weak link was one of their lookout persons. Um, clearly, he didn't have the discipline that they wanted. He was getting bored, uh, probably cold, probably a little bit frightened, and as such was overusing uh, the radio system. I personally think there was more than one lookout, and probably there was a different frequency being used as well, which Mr. Rollins was not picking up. When one looks at the amount of equipment that was accrued to carry out this job, they took other means and methods of communication besides the one they were doing. Despite their differences, it appears the gang decided to have a break partway through the robbery and resumed only to be almost caught when the police called in with the bank manager. They did not panic and they knew that they'd got a window of time. Once the bank had been visited, they knew that unless they were visited again, then they had a reasonable amount of time to exit from the premises with the stolen cash, jewelry, and then they managed to uh, get out of the bank by going back through the tunnel, um, which was uh, an endeavor on its, on, on its own. When officers turned on their heels at the vault door, the gang made their getaway. When they vacated the property, uh, they exited through a rear window in order to leave the property locked and secured so that even if it drew attention, um, access was not going to be gained immediately. The team knew their method of entry would catch the authorities off guard and buy them more time. By the time officers realized they had visited the raided bank, the criminals were well away. I'm sure that some monies were already into other vaults elsewhere or abroad the whole element of where to shift money through money laundering would have been already in action it's often been put about that there were insiders involved personally i don't believe that because criminals would not trust an individual who worked in a bank to hold up to keeping the secret long enough that they intended to exploit their knowledge this would have involved planning for more than at least two or three months, uh, particularly to get together the equipment. Some elements of the crime will always remain a mystery. None of the stolen goods were recovered from the raid, and the total value of what was taken has always been open to speculation. No one will ever know, because some of those boxes may have been full of all sorts of exciting things. The final estimate was that it was about one and a half million pounds, which is a lot of money in uh, those days. But no one will ever know precisely because in these uh, bank boxes, uh, people wouldn't necessarily want to disclose what they were keeping there. <laughs>
The Baker Street heist goes down in criminal history thanks to Robert Rowlands honing in on the thieves' radio frequency. But Scotland Yard were keen to pick up on a crime Rowlands himself was committing on the evening. After the robbery, the police were considering prosecuting me for listening to unlicensed transmissions under the Wireless and Telegraphy Act. They were persuaded not to prosecute me because it would be very bad publicity for the police force, considering that I was trying to help them find the robbers. Fifteen years later, I got the cassette back. It was hiding in a, in a safe in Paddington Green Police Station in London. Rowlands was also contacted by Lloyds. They gave me a cheque for £2,500, which I thought was extremely decent of them. Such a brazen attack on a bank has not been witnessed in Britain before or after 1971. A final twist in the tale could give an insight into where the gang got their inspiration. Someone pointed out that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's fictional detective Sherlock Holmes had investigated a near identical uh, robbery. Now, Sherlock Holmes was supposed to live in uh, Baker Street, and here you have a bank in uh, Baker Street. Now, in one of his stories, he said that uh, he'd learned of some robbers who had dug uh, a tunnel from a shop next door to a bank, had tunneled down, and then had come up into the bank. The only difference between the Sherlock Holmes story and this one was that Sherlock Holmes was waiting inside the bank when the robbers came up through the, the floor. Four years after Baker Street, an inside job netted another gang doubled the money. The brand new series of Britain's biggest heists continues next Thursday at 8. Tonight, Sky Movie's crime and thriller is hitting the bank robbery capital of America. Ben Affleck and John Hamm star in The Town next. Well, here on CI, it's beyond Sked Street.